Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this RM Edu Summit session on using Microsoft tools for enhanced learning. In this session, we've got James Green, Darren Baber and Phil Evans who will be talking about how you as a technology professional can support your school's use of technology to enable blended learning in this new world that we found ourselves in. If you've got any questions for our presenters throughout this presentation, if you just want to pop them in the Q&A box, uh, and that's in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, um, but with, without any further ado, I'll hand you over to James. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm James Green. I'm head of field operations at RM. I head up the team that provides a range of services, including project installations, education and technology consultancy and a full range of uh, managed services from light touch support through to fully managed support. Um, today, we're going to be looking at what RM are doing across our customer portfolio from a technology perspective. We're looking to facilitate better outcomes for your students utilizing the latest Microsoft technologies. Um, speaking with me today, as has been mentioned, is Darren Baber and Philip Evans. Uh, Darren's worked at RM for over 20 years in a variety of technically focused roles. He's currently working as a principal support consultant, working with all the latest Microsoft technologies. He leads on our Intune portfolio covering Azure AD, M365 and Teams. Philip is one of our operations managers who supports over 80 schools in the Dudley area. He's an ex-school governor and has two children, both in secondary school. He is a believer in lightning workloads for teachers and knowledge sharing and is working on our new RM Vantage platform. We'll have more on that later. Um, just a quick bit of advice. If you're viewing the demo parts of the session that Darren's going to be running, can we all please ensure we've maximized the screen in the browser top right of the video window? Click the two little arrows, just makes the screen a bit bigger so you can get a better view. And again, as we start this session, I'll hand you over to Darren. Good afternoon, all. Thanks for joining this session. So, um, as, uh, as James said, uh, my name is Darren Baber. I've been at RM over 20 years, and I'll be taking you through um, essentially device and endpoint management um, in this new world. So we'll be looking at Intune, um, or endpoint manager, as Microsoft have called it, and what it can do to, to help you um, move from your, your current sol solution towards a more cloud-focused approach and a, and a serverless solution, hopefully, eventually. I will be jumping back and forth between, as it was said, between my slides and some demos so that we can, we can see a little bit about Intune and, and what it can bring you. So first of all, what is Intune? Um, we'll be looking at uh, some application deployment through Intune, um, how we manage our profiles on our endpoints, so how we lock them down, how we, how we secure them, um, and a little bit on licensing, how we license Intune, um, how we make it available to our users. Um, and then we look at autopilot, which is, is essentially how we enroll devices into Intune so that we have full management of those endpoints. Um, and finally, I'll touch a little bit on security. So um, application protection, MFA, and conditional access. So Microsoft Intune, um, or Endpoint Manager, as it's now being called. So uh, that's a very complicated architectural diagram of Intune. I'll let you digest it in your leisure later when you get the slides. Um, but it essentially is showing that Intune is part of the Azure stack. It integrates into Azure Active Directory, Office 365. It has a web console to manage it. It's all done in the cloud. And essentially, as that graphic shows, everything is then focused on the endpoint, your, your end devices. Um, it's worth noting that, my, that RM do focus on Windows 10 devices with Intune, um, but Intune is an MDM. It's a mobile device management tool, and you can manage Android devices. You can manage iOS devices, but we do focus purely on Windows 10 with our solution. So Intune, um, as I say, Microsoft have renamed it to Endpoint Manager just because it is, it is really just managing your endpoints from the cloud. Um, and as I say, everything is done from the cloud. So we are, we're looking to remove servers here. And as long as those endpoints have an internet connection, any configuration changes you make in Intune, so when you add an application, you update security, you send a script down to those devices, that will just go through the cloud to those devices. Um, we can do application deployment through Intune. We can do profile management through Intune. But it's probably easier if I just take you through the UI a little bit to, uh, to show you some of this in uh, to show you it live. So if, you've, uh, if you can see that, make sure it's maximized so you get the full benefit. Um, and first of all, I should thank um, a customer of, our Jag, of ours, Jag Deep at the Adult College for letting me into his portal today to show you uh, a live, a live Intune. So 
this is the portal you get to, um, endpoint.microsoft.com. Um, and as you can see there, down the left-hand side, you will see some of the key categories, devices, apps, endpoint security, users and groups. So I can manage my users and groups in here if, if I were in the Azure admin portal in, in Azure Active Directory and I was managing users, I get the same view as users and groups and I can create them and manage users, add licenses, et cetera, in the same way. Um, but like I say, the key thing about Endpoint Manager, about Intune, is managing your endpoints, managing your devices. So if I look at the all devices link here, I will see a list of all the computers or, uh, that I've enrolled into Intune that I'm in managing. Um, and I'll be able to see when they've last checked in, what version of Windows 10 they're at. I can drill down further, clicking on a device. I can see the managed applications that I've pushed to, through Intune to these endpoints. So Microsoft Edge for Windows 10, the Chrome version of Edge, um, Sway, M365 apps, which is Office, that's because Microsoft have renamed Office. Um, and I can see Sophos Central. So this customer is using Sophos for their uh, antivirus solution. I can see device configuration results here. So these are, as I've mentioned just now, the, the profiles that are going down to the device, the things that are actually controlling the settings on the device and locking it down or opening it up, depending on who is using this device. You can see here, um, this device is prefixed with STF1. Um, which we, with our solution from RM, use to denote a staff one-to-one -one device. Um, the way our solution works in Intune, we have a, a rinse and repeat solution, and we have segregated devices really into four key categories, staff one-to-one, -one, staff shared, student one-to-one, -one, and student shared devices. And then we then have everything device-centric, so policies, applications, et cetera, and scripts will go down to those devices based on what you want to do with those devices. So clearly a staff one-to-one -one device will be a lot less locked down and open, and then you go through the, the various levels as we go along. Intune will also feed back useful information to me about the device, so the hardware, um, the free space. Um, I can see things like my, my TPM chip, which is going to be quite important for autopilot, and we'll come on to that later. Um, but that, in the device management, I can then look at, as I mentioned, configuration profiles. These are the things that, that actually set the security on the device. So um, if I look at my devices, Windows 10 general, um, and if you're familiar with group policy on local active directory, a lot of this might look quite similar or, or, or you know, um, similar to you in terms of, of the settings we're making. So I can drill down into here. Um, I can go into the control panel, and I can block things like um, a gaming. If I want to block the gaming options on these devices, I just switch that slider across and click review and save. So very similar to how we do things in group policy, but a lot sort of richer UI. We can also manage applications, as I've mentioned through Intune. Again, the all apps view shows me all the applications I've added and whether they're assigned or not. But I can add into here MSIs, I can add XEs, so Win32 apps, although I have to wrap those using a special tool first before Intune can use them, which is on GitHub. Um, I can add in Microsoft Store apps. So if I go to the Store for Education and search for a particular app I want, such as the whiteboard, maybe my session hasn't timed out, it has. Um, I can find that app, add it into Intune, and then deploy it out to my, my devices. So it's the Microsoft whiteboard. I can I could just add that and push it through Intune. So um, I would recommend if you are moving to Intune from something like an on-prem Active Directory and a solution such as CC4 from RM, Community Connect 4, that you do look at starting to reduce the sort of application load. So Intune is far lighter touch for your endpoint devices. And we recommend looking for web versions of your applications where possible and replacing some of those bulkier apps you may have pushed across a local AD. Obviously, we're talking about cloud management here. Um, and that would be more useful if you're using something like RM Unify, and then you can add those tiles into Unify as well, because this is all, once you've logged on with your Office 365 account to an Intune managed device, you'll have single sign-on through RM Unify as well. So lots of benefits of, uh, of doing it this way and looking to, to move away from those on-prem apps that uh, you know, find the cloud alternatives. So that's 
that's a little bit about Intune and how it all looks. Trying to get back to my slides. So as I say, we've got all this cloud management, um, but Intune can do much more. There are so many um, features on that front page. I haven't got the time to take you through today. Um, but you may have heard of something called Intune for Education. Um, this is just really a skin over the top of the full portal. So everything I've been showing you today is the full Intune for Education portal. But Microsoft have provided this Intune for Education portal, which is just a skin over the top of this main portal. So if you're familiar with CC4, then we have the CC4 Management Console. Um, if you're managing group policy objects in that, that's really a skin over the top of the full group policy um, engine. And you can go and make further changes in GPMC on your Active Directory. So if any change I make in Intune for Education will also appear in the full portal, obviously. But we do recommend that you stick to this full portal. The Intune for Education is, a, is really a stripped down one. You won't see all the settings you probably need. And it was really de designed for primary schools with, I guess, somebody managing their IT for them within the school who wants to just deploy quickly to a small number of devices. Um, the full portal is, is where we tend to push customers. If I want to deploy an SSL certificate for SmoothWall or SafetyNet, I have to do it through this full portal. There are no options in Intune for Education. So as I've mentioned, our solution here is device-centric. We, we segregate everything into devices. You enroll div your Windows 10 devices into one of those four key groups, staff one-to-one, -one, staff shared, student one-to-one, -one, and student shared. Um, there's a link there in the notes um, to take you to what is the difference between a one-to-one -one device and a shared uh, device. The real key difference is in, I guess, OneDrive files on demand. So if I'm using a one-to-one -one device, like my laptop, my work laptop here, um, I can browse around my OneDrive folders and files as though, they were, as though they were local on my machine, and OneDrive files on demand manages access and pulls them down as needed. Um, if I am using a shared device, I only get access to the OneDrive web app and can interact with my files and folders only through that web app. So that's, that's a key thing to think about. Um, most of the schools that we've been working with, and if you're at the session this morning for the Forest Fed, they're using this solution. Intune is their management solution for their endpoints. They they use, obviously, they use OneDrive um, and the Microsoft apps that they're using through Project are OneDrive aware. So when we save as, it's going through to these, to these OneDrive folders anyway. So... As I say, our profiles and our apps, scripts, et cetera, they're all deployed down to your devices and they then install the apps, make the profile changes. Um, there is a, Intune has a rolling um, update cycle. I think once in, the device is enrolled into Intune, it's something like every eight hours, the device will automatically check in for updates, but you can force a sync from the user interface or run some simple PowerShell um, that we provide that, allows you to sync across all your devices and force them to check in if you want something to happen quicker. Um, but like I say, the second part of my talk is about enrolling devices into Intune. And we recommend that you enroll devices from the out-of-box experience. So clean Windows 10 device without any additional OEM added applications. So a fresh Windows 10 device, and then enroll them from there into Intune so that you have full management and the best experience. Um, and there are two ways to do this um, enrollment. So something called Autopilot that we're going to talk about next and the Setup School PCs app. Um, a little quick bit about the Setup School PCs app. That is, um, it's available on the Microsoft Store. You can see I've, I've run the front screen there. Essentially, it's a wizard you follow. Um, you make your config changes in there, and we recommend very few config changes apart from naming the device so it fits in with the groups that we've created. So STF1 for staff one-to-one, -one, STFS for staff shared. Um, it creates a provisioning package that goes on the pen drive, as you can see on step two. And then once your machine is at the out-of-box experience and it has a valid internet connection, plug the USB drive in and it will enroll into Intune. So that, that's option one. However, 
we recommend if you are going to be bulk enrolling devices and you've got a lot of devices, say 250, 300 devices coming along, that you use autopilot. Sorry, I've forgotten I was going to talk about licensing before that. But um, briefly, if we are, if you're going through Intune, then we recommend Microsoft 365 A3 licenses because they contain Intune for Education as well as um, Office, the M365 apps is within that license, as well as Minecraft, a Windows 10 upgrade license and other things. However, you can purchase Intune for Education separately if you've already got a tenancy and you've already got your Office 365 A1 Plus or M365 apps for staff and faculty and students, you can just add Intune on top of that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when we, when we enroll these devices, they will pick up all our config. They will install a local office onto those devices. So we do recommend having either M365 apps or Office 365 A1 Plus or the equivalent of that because without that, you won't be able to be licensed properly when using Office on that machine. So sorry about diverting away from autopilot there. But um, as I say, autopilot is our, is our recommended approach for enrolling the devices into Intune. It is, as Microsoft call it, it's a near white glove approach to device enrollment. So your Windows 10 devices are initially pre-populated into autopilot via a CSV file. And that CSV file has a unique hardware ID for each device. Um, once that CSV file has been processed and um, autopilot and Intune have created temporary computer objects in Azure for each of those devices that are coming along, those devices are then associated with your tenancy. So there's a, a level of security there. If, if one of them gathered legs and walked off, somebody rebuilt it, tried to push it through the out-of-box experience, it will go back through into your Intune tenancy because the out-of-box experience is aware that this device has been added to your tenancy and will seek to push it back through Intune. It's only if you deleted it out of your autopilot setup that that, that would go away. We assign an autopilot profile to each device. And in keeping with our solution, we have four autopilot profiles for staff one-to-one, -one, staff shared, et cetera. So those four autopilot profiles match the four groups that we've already talked about for our devices. And then simply you boot to the out-of-box experience. As long as you've got a suitable internet connection, follow the out-of-box experience and autopilot will just kick in in the background and that device will be enrolled into Intune. It pulls down this autopilot profile and then the device is ready to be used. I'll do a quick little uh, run through of some of those points. So that's a sample of a um, CSV file that we would upload into autopilot. As you can see, we've got the device serial number and then it's hardware hash um, unique to the computer. We would go into Intune here into the devices enroll devices and then devices again um, and we would at that point import that csv uh, and upload it and once that is done oops once that file is imported i will see a list of all my devices um, with their model number mentioned um, and i would then go and assign that to a particular profile so you can see for example um, this HP stream has been assigned to the student shared devices, um, the student shared autopilot devices profile. And so when it was enrolled into Intune, it will be called STUS with the serial number at the end. Um, you can see those enrollment profiles or the autopilot profiles here. As I mentioned, four profiles to mention to man to sort of link in with the four device groups that we use. So staff one-to-one -one autopilot devices um, will, if a device has been put into that group, into the staff one-to-one -one autopilot devices group, when it comes to the out-of-box experience, it will be enrolled into Intune. It will be renamed by the autopilot process to STF1 with the serial number at the end. By the way, you can rename these devices when they're in Intune, once, once they're ready and up and running. Um, as long as you keep the naming convention the same, STF1 hyphen J Smith, once it's built, and then you know that that is a one-to-one -one laptop for Mr. Smith, for example. Um, but like I say, it is all about getting these devices 
first of all, bulk imported, assigned to a profile, and then you can just boot them up and follow the process through. Now, this is where there are some, I would guess, some uh, some key pointers to understand about the uh, the autopilot process. So we have two approaches to enrolling the devices. If there are one-to-one -one devices, that is done through something called user-driven enrollment. So at the out-of-box experience phase, then you need to log on as a user. And it can either be, depending on how you lock it down or open it up, it can either be one of your global admin accounts so that you have control over which devices are being enrolled, or it could be the end user that's going to get that device. As I say, we initially lock that down to a given group of users so you have more control. Um, or it can be something called self-driven enrollment. So those shared devices that we've talked about, um, they do something called self-driven enrollment. So they'll come to the out-of-box experience. You'll click next, next, and then it just will self-enroll. But what that needs to do that is something called self-attestation during the out-of-box experience. So the device itself goes through its TPM chip off to the manufacturer, pulls back a certificate, which is then used as part of the enrollment. So that device is the actual security token that is enrolling itself into Intune. Um, and that's where the TPM 2.0 chip reliance comes from. If you haven't got TPM 2.0 and you're looking at legacy devices on sh and you wanted them to be shared, then you would have to use the Setup School PCs app that I spoke about. You can't push those through autopilot if they don't have a TPM 2.0 chip. User-driven, because it is involving a, a, a user to authenticate and then enroll, that doesn't need TPM, but the self-driven does. Um, and it's very important to look at and understand all the network requirements for Intune to operate successfully, and particularly for um, the, the TPM, the self-driven side of it, that does need additional networking requirements because the computer will go off and talk to the hardware manufacturer to pull down a certificate. But those links explain it all. Um, and we do recommend an Ethernet cable at the out-of-box experience phase just for I guess, better success of these devices going through um, into Intune. So to summarize the enrollment, so there are two main methods, as I've said, from the out-of-box phase that, that we recommend using setup school PCs, which is the USB drive, um, you know, slightly slower because you create, you may, you may have to create four separate provisioning packages, keep track of them and plug them into the right devices that you're looking at or autopilot where we have this bulk process, the CSV and assign profiles. Um, and there's a little summary table to sort of summarize what I said, that if you're looking at shared devices without TPM 2.0, so you may be coming to Intune and thinking, I've got a lot of legacy devices, Windows 7 machines that I want to use in Intune. If you wanted to use those and have them shared, you would have to use the setup school PCs to enroll them. Um, but it, that's that's the only limitation in that in that respect. So finally, security. So um, with our standard setup for Intune, we can add in something called application protection. Um, that's for managed and unmanaged devices. So if you've got somebody with their mobile phone and they're accessing the school data through that mobile phone, even if that mobile phone is not controlled or managed fully through your Intune, we can put these application protection policies in place that force the user to use certain applications when looking at the data. So if they go into email, they have to use Outlook. Um, once they're in their emails or their Word documents that they're looking at through their phone, then they cannot screenshot, they cannot use backups of that data, et cetera, et cetera. These are all configurable through Intune and give you an, another layer of security on top. So it's all about, you know, back in the on-prem AD days, your security was, was your school because everything was in the school, the servers were in the school, the data was in the school. Now your data is moving to the cloud. So we need to think carefully about what we want to do in terms of protecting that data and how that can be accessed which is where MFA, multi-factor authentication, comes in. So you can say, it's not just your password that lets me into my account. I need the Microsoft Authenticator app on my phone, and that will give the second proof to say who I am and then let me progress through the logon. Um, I know phones in schools is a, is a tricky topic. 
Um, but there are sort of access tokens you can buy with a rotating numerical number field on there that people can type in as their, their second factor to prove who they are. Um, and finally, there's conditional access. Um, that does need, um, I think, the Azure AD P1 licensing in there to, uh, to make it work or to allow you to use it. But that is more of a signal verified data. So somebody is logging in and wants to use the finance app at the school. Do I require MFA for that? Do I require them to be on an IP address within the school to let that happen? Um, conditional access gives you this. If this is going to happen, verify that attempt and then let them through to that data and app or block them going to that data and app. So that's very configurable. You have to be very careful with what you do with it so you don't lock everyone out. But it, 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 is, it does allow you to have sort of far more flexibility um, over your security. So. I will hand over to Phil, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Darren. Hello, everyone. I'm going to show you some nice uh, collaboration tools that you may not be fully aware of in Microsoft 365. Many people don't know about Microsoft Whiteboard and the, the, what it can do. And this isn't just the doodling canvas built into Teams. The full fat app has more tools and features, and it's found in the Windows App Store. And as uh, Darren showed you, you can then deploy that through Intune as well. I'm going to show you a handful of the features and benefits. As a teaching tool, it's great. You can uh, use text if you're, you've not got great handwriting. Um, you can zoom out if you want a bigger canvas as well. So you're not just restricted to what's on screen there. So you can have it as a real um, collaborative uh, whiteboard um, through, through the Zoom feature as well. You can add images, lists, post-it notes, even embed Word and PDF or PowerPoint slides into your board. With Ink to Shape, you can draw it and it will convert it to a geometric shape. And with the object snapping, they'll stick to your alignment. You can use a ruler and format background uh, to get some grid lines to make your, your board look uh, suitable for handwriting or mathematics. You can also change the background color if you've got uh, children with uh, visual difficulties such as dyspraxia. And uh, as I say, you can change the paper type for different types of graphs or grids or using the space lines for students doing handwriting practice. And did I mention you've got glitter and galaxy pens? So if that's not sold you, then I may as well pack up right now. A great feature like most Microsoft products is the ability to collaborate. So you can share your board via email or you can post it to a Teams channel. And this can be a class Teams channel, which of course means students both in class and learning remotely can all collaborate and see your board simultaneously. There is also the option of using whiteboards in Teams video lessons in the breakouts room uh, uh, option. Next, I'm gonna dip into Microsoft Teams and Microsoft 365. So unlike SharePoint, which you may be familiar with, where you have to potentially check out, change your document, check it back in, then inform the other collaborators that you've done your bit, Office documents saved within Teams allow multiple people with access to work on the document at the same time. And if you're late to the party, you can click on the activity catch up button to see what has been do done thus far. And you can add comments and using the link to share with colleagues once you've finished. Though probably not its intended feature, using the thumbs icon for posts within Teams, you can use that for new policies and procedural documents that you've drafted and finalized, which means you can see a list of staff who have effectively agreed to them. So no more signatures of piece of paper pinned to staff notice boards. Simply by thumbs up, you can then audit and list who has actually read and understood the document. Next, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how you can do parents' evenings using some of the tools in Microsoft 365. Obviously, in terms of comms for staff sharing when the event will happen, using the post area of Teams is a good way to do that. And you can cascade the information using the at team name to flag this up in the activity area for all the people in your staff team. Planner is a great way to assign the tasks required to do the job. So the, targs, the cards are created and put into buckets where a checklist for each task can be registered and any updates and de deadlines set. 
and you can also assign them to individuals as well. Microsoft Forms is very much like SurveyMonkey, but free. It's great for surveys and getting information in. And with the added benefit of quizzes, it's a great labor-saving teaching tool as well. Depending on your license agreement, you can use Microsoft Bookings, which is a bolt-on to Outlook, either as a self-booking service tool where your parents could dial in and select the slot they want, or it could be a consolidated calendar where bookings are made on behalf of the parents by school staff. Then, of course, there's the actual parents evening itself. Each staff member simply needs to create a Teams appointment, copy the link, and then give that link to the parents for their assigned time slot. All they need to do is ensure that they click on the option to ensure that parents wait in the lobby and allow them in when it's their slot. So the teacher stays in one video conference, much as they would do if they was in person and the parents were waiting inside, outside the classroom. Next, it's showing off your students' work. So typically you would do a book trawl or you'd show some examples of where the students excelled in their, their school uh, term so far. And Sway is a great way of doing that. I'm gonna add this hyperlink to the chat. You're welcome to have a look at either now or at the end of this presentation, uh, just purely because it doesn't really do it justice uh, in our PowerPoint presentation slide here. But it's very easy to set up, very uh, easy to add those attachments that you uh, can see there, photographs, um, pictures of their work and any comments that you want to make about that. But it looks professional. It looks like a, a website that you've spent hours creating. And there's plenty of themes and templates that you can use as part of uh, your presentation to parents there. Then, of course, you want to uh, use Microsoft Forms again to get that real time feedback. So most parents evenings, you'll do a survey to ask how the parents feel their, their child is at school, if they feel safe, if they're enjoying school, if they've got any feedback about their, their homework, etc. So using Microsoft Forms, you don't have to have that manual piece of paper that somebody has to kick key into a spreadsheet. It's all done real time. As soon as somebody fills in the survey, you get the real uh, results, real-time results that you can then export into Excel if you wish. So appreciate that is a, a whistle-stop tour of Microsoft 365. If you are interested in learning more, I've got a couple of videos. Again, I'll put into the chat um, for you to, to view at your leisure. Um, and you can obviously see in more detail what I've shown you in the PowerPoint slides. And obviously managing Microsoft tenancies is something that RM do, bread and butter. We ensure they're safe and secure, as well as going server free. We provide a consultative data migration tool, as well as training for staff. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time listening to both Darren and myself. Um, hopefully that gives you a taste of what blended learning could look like in your schools. And I'll hand over to James and Melanie for any Q&A for today. Thanks very much, Phil and Darren and James. Um, that was really insightful. Uh, lo lots of exciting tools that schools are using, I know, already. Um, so while I wait to see if any questions come in, I've got a question myself, if that's OK. Um, so being a parent myself, I've seen obviously my children uh, doing, their, doing a lot of their schoolwork from home over the past uh, 14 months. And I'm um, really interested to know uh, what kind of tools um, some schools and teachers in particular are using to make sure that students, you know, weren't sort of muting each other or able to mute the teacher or if they needed to have sort of control over cameras on or off. Um, have you got any advice uh, for schools on that if they haven't cracked that yet? Um, I guess I'll pick, I'll pick that one up. Um, so I guess that's, that's really Teams, isn't it? And, and Teams config. So we, we do have, um, so, so way back when when lockdown first started kicking in, and, and everyone was 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 rushing to the cloud and and, and getting everything in place, um, we did we did come up with a set of RM templates for teams. So we have an RM staff and RM student set of templates that we can apply to to any tenancy really. Um, and those, I guess, as you say, then lock down teams so it doesn't turn into WhatsApp, um, <laughs> and it gives you that level of security and and. Uh, and and yeah and, and and control really so that uh, the pupils can do only what you want them to do um and the teachers are then i guess in control of the lessons teams has obviously 
improved over time from Microsoft and they've added you know newer features to to give you that control as well but we have these templates that lock it down I think the other um, aspect is as well the it, and it's one that most teachers forget about is hanging up as opposed to ending the meeting so they do a virtual lesson if they just hang up it will it will still leave the students left in the classroom unattended as it were a bit like if they're walking out of the uh the, the classroom so they just need to remember to click on the end meeting button otherwise that can happen um so, so another tip out there for you i think a question come in from brenda so if we've uh, have we got access to the q a session section Oh, yes. OK, so question from Brenda is, is it safe to assume that DFE laptops um, all have TPM 2.0 as it seems the DFE have been using Intune? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, as far as I understand TPM 2.0, that should be in pretty much all modern devices. So I would I would hope that it is. Um, there's a there's a simple tool that you can use on on your computer to check if it's if it's there and if it's ready, um, it's TPM tools space get device information. It's just a command line. And that will tell you, as well as the TPM version, it will tell you if it's ready for attestation that I mentioned for this. I am who I say I am. I think I guess what, it, what it's trying to say there. Um, it, I, I've got a brand new laptop as, at, at work. Um, and I was interested to see when I ran that tool, it threw an error because TPM is present on my laptop and it's TPM2 because it's a new laptop. Um, but TPM was hidden in the BIOS, so you may have to do a little bit of digging depending on the device. Um, TPM is used for things like BitLocker, and my device BitLocker is fine with TPM in hidden mode, but I wouldn't be able to use it for autopilot in the state it was de delivered in. I would have to go into the BIOS and enable TPM. Sometimes a firmware update is also needed as well. You may find that when you run this TPM tool, it says, is the device ready and capable of attestation? It will give you a true and false message for those. Um, if it's not showing you true for both of those, you will have to update the firmware. But you've always got this fallback of the Setup School PCs app to enroll them in. So it's not as though that device, you know, if you're going to use it as shared, um, can't be pushed into Intune. You've got you know, the one-to-one -one approach, which will go through anyway because of the, the user account, or you've got the Setup School PCs if you want to use them for shared. So. There are there are solutions depending on what you've got on the device. Great. Okay. Um, another question we've just had in is: uh, Will we be posting this webinar for viewing later? Yep. So I was going to come to that in my in my wrapping up. Um, so yes, uh, this webinar will will be emailed to all attendees within 24 to 48 hours of, of attending. And also anybody that's registered for the RM Edu Summit um, will get access for the next three months to any of the sessions that you haven't been able to make live or that you want to watch again. I probably should have added in there to Brenda as well that I guess, you know, one of the reasons that the DFE question may have come in is because I think the DFE licensing is only until is it September this year on those uh, those in tune devices. End of so, September, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's worth noting and understanding that because obviously you would have to, I guess, you know, relicense them and you know push them back into your tenancy, uh, you know, simple rebuilds. Um, I probably didn't mention that, you know, once those devices are are in Intune, are in your tenancy, and you've gone through this process. You have very quick things in Intune, like autopilot reset, where you can take that device, quickly flush it back to um, you know when it came out of the about out of box experience and first enrolled into Intune. So you can quickly get it back to a, a nice known state without having to full rebuild. So Intune's got a, a lot of good benefits built in for that. Um, I think I've I've recommended that to customers if if they want. A device to eventually be shared between students but on a sort of longer term basis you might build that as a one-to-one -one student device that's used by student a for a few weeks bring it back to school wipe it with autopilot reset hand it to the next one within an hour so it's you know or, or quicker so you know there are there are lots of ways you can look at approaching this cloud management and uh, endpoint manager yeah and uh, brenda's added to the chat yep that's right we have 200 of these we need to take over mm -hmm. So yeah, so perfect. So you know, if we can, <laughs> if we can get a, if we can get a CSV file, we can look at autopilot, and we can, you know, you can if you've if you've got them already, you can run that TPM tool, um, and see if that uh, if that helps to you to understand what what state they're in. Hopefully, there are. Okay. 
Was there another question in the pot? I, I thought ben I just saw another up. one. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that gone? Oh, published. Uh -huh. Okay, so do we have to ensure the people running the DFE laptops remove them from their Intune? Uh, that's a good question. I, it would depend on how they were initially provisioned through the DFE in tune. If, if it was done through autopilot, then we would have to get them removed from, yeah, from the DFE um, autopilot. Because as I said earlier, they, once you associate a device through autopilot with your tenancy, it is associated. So if you try to autopilot that into a separate tenancy, you'll get an error back saying already associated with tenancy X. Well, I think it doesn't actually tell you the name of the tenancy for security, but it will tell you that there's an error. So it would be good for us to, yeah, we'd probably need to work with Brenda to understand. Um, I was, I would expect that the DFE have, have probably only enrolled them with setup school PCs or, or some sort of manual enrollment, but it'd be worth us finding out more to, to see what, what we need to request from them before we can uh, move them into a managed tenancy or her managed tenancy. Okay. I think that's it for the questions coming in. Over to you, James. Yeah, lovely. Um, I, 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 hope, I, I found that very valuable myself as well. Hopefully today everyone's found something they, they didn't know or some new news that they had there. Um, we've shown you some of the ways you can support your school's use of technology to enable that blended learning that the session's been about. Um, here at RM, we're working on a number of exciting new platforms that focus on cloud migration and blended learning. Um, and I'd just like to take a, a, a small opportunity here to just give you some more detail on um, our brand new RM Vantage platform that is, is very, very recently been launched. Um, it intends to be a simple solution with everything you need from the latest uh, in network infrastructure through to the best cloud storage and application platforms through to the MIS of your, your school needs. Currently, this is uh, in um, available for primary schools has been developed initially to run on Microsoft's cloud platform technologies. But there are future developments in the pipeline for secondary schools and also including the options to select Google as your cloud vendor of choice. Um, I wanted to reference it because we have a drop in virtual session um, with RM's Michael Oak starting at 430 today, uh, which should be in your agendas. He'll be covering strategic planning and how the change in technical landscape means you should and can plan differently around market research, around use of tech in schools, current strategies and how they can be holding schools back and how to approach a strategy well. So I think it's sort of it nicely sort of tail ends into what we've been talking about here if you if you look at attending that session. And I'd like to hand back to Mel to close us off. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, James. So we, we did just have another last question come in, um, which I think Phil has answered in the chat. Um, so hopefully that is uh, that's that's all fine and answered. If anybody does have any other questions after this session that occurs, then you know do come to the the Knowledge Hub um, uh, on the conference website, um, and we've got a number of virtual exhibition booths in different topic areas. Um, so if you come to any of those that seem relevant to your question, there'll be somebody from RM who's available uh, online to to answer those. Um, so yeah, just to just to round off, um, as I said, within 24 to 48 hours, um, you should receive an attendee pack by email that'll have have a link to this recording, um, a certificate of attendance, um, and also a survey, which um, would be really grateful if people could fill out to give us some feedback to help us um, with future events like this. Um, also, um, as, as well as James encouraging you to go to the 4.30 session, I'd also like to encourage people to go to the 3.30 session if it's of interest to you. Um, and that's all about um, using Google technology and tools to support all learners. So leaving no learners behind um, by utilizing uh, features and functionality of the uh, of the Google um, tenancy for that. And that's with RM's David Fitzpatrick, along with Patrick McGrath from Text Help. Um, so uh, I, I think that's it from all of us here. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of our Edgy Summit. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all.